On today's video, we look at a fascinating story from the UK. A story that involves jewels, sex, huge sums of money, royalty, mobsters, high level government involvement and a cover up. However, probably the most important thing for me and likely for you is that this story also involves walkie talkies and ham radio. It's a great example of how the hobby and the radios can be used for both bad and for good. So settle in and enjoy this blast from the past into a shady London crime that still to this day has elements that are yet to be discovered. In 1970, a photographer living in North London called Anthony Gavin came up with a plan that up until this point in time had only been envisaged in a single fictional book. And this plan was to tunnel underground and up into the vaults of a bank without using any weapons or setting off any alarms in order to steal millions and millions of pounds of cash, jewellery and other valuable documents, as we will see. I know this story might seem familiar in more recent memory, however this is not the story of the more recent Hatton Garden heist, although they are very probably connected via one of the gang members, possibly. This robbery was carried out on September the 11th, 1971, and is known as both the Baker Street robbery and the Walkie Talkie robbery. The ringleader Gavin had connections through the London underworld and he recruited some of these men and women to assist him in the planning and the actual execution of the heist. Now there are a lot of documentaries that cover the subject in its entirety and also movies like The Bank Job with Jason Statham from 2008 which documents the story of the heist with some fairly obvious movie embellishments and taking some documented suspicions around the case as being true when they actually haven't been proven so. However, it's a fun movie all the same, even though they are pictured using Pi 5000 radios which didn't officially come out until almost 10 years later. The raid was planned so that a gang member would rent a premises as close to the bank as possible and they would dig a tunnel underground and tunnel under the buildings and up through the floor of the vault. The plan was to use a thermal lance to burn away through any steel or concrete that they would encounter However, first they would have to shift at least 7 metric tons of earth to create a 40 foot long metre wide tunnel. The gang had an inside contact working in the bank who had told them that because local construction work had been setting the alarm off in the bank, they would periodically switch off the alarms when construction was taking place. This was the cue for the gang to move in to the rented premises and start digging. As you can imagine, this was a feat that took some time. In fact, months, mostly working at weekends, and during this period the gang used AMCB walkie-talkies to communicate from underground in the tunnel to the basement of the store and up to a lookout who was stationed on the top of a pub over the road. The gang were possibly using radios such as these ones. Working on the assumption that the gang members were probably not radio hams or radio enthusiasts, it's very likely that they had hold of the most powerful AM radios that they could get at the time. No images have surfaced of the actual radios that the gang used, but they were apparently left behind at the scene. It is very possible that the gang also had use of and were monitoring the police radios as well, as this was well before the days of encrypted radio signals. It is very possible that the lookout on the top of the pub was also using a Pi pocket phone, such as this one, to listen in and to advise the team of any impending activity on the airwaves. It was the volume of this radio traffic over the months of digging that alerted one young man who was living quite close to the scene who stumbled onto chat one evening whilst trying to nod off to his sleep in his apartment. On Saturday the 11th of September 1971, the gang broke through into the vault and there was a spike in radio acti activity that was picked up. Robert Rowlands was just about half a mile away from the scene and as an avid shortwave listener he would often listen to the wireless to help him drift off to sleep. However, he would also like to listen in to shortwave transmissions as well. Now, in the years that passed, Rowlands was listed as being a radio ham. However, he was only a shortwave listener. And just for fun, he used to like to tune in to the ham radio and the CB frequencies, which at the time wasn't strictly legal unless you were licensed. More of that later. During the early 70s, CB radio was really taking off here in the UK, as we've already covered on the channel. And although not very common, it could be picked up quite easy with the right equipment. 
Of course, in the movie, Rowlands is pictured using a much more modern radio receiver. However, in reality, he was using some very old gear as shown in the photo. It was late in the evening and Rowlands was scanning through when he heard something that was a little out of the ordinary. He wasn't exactly sure, but he thought that he had stumbled onto something criminal in nature, so he continued to listen into it. Rowlands became increasingly concerned that in fact his local tobacconist was being robbed and that he decided to call the police. The officer who took the call seemed indifferent to Rowlands' claims and he advised Rowlands to record any further conversations. So Rowlands did just that and he picked up his little tape recorder and held it next to the speaker. Little did he know at the time, but Rowlands was recording the activity and the voices of the criminals involved in one of Britain's biggest robberies, or burglaries as it was officially classified as, as it was in progress. Here is some of the actual audio that Rowlands recorded at the time. It's amazing quality if you think about it. This is 50 years ago. As he continued to listen in, Rowlands could hear the robbers complain that the thermal lance wasn't working and they might have to blow it. He also heard them complain about the fumes. As you can imagine, all of that mechanical work in such a tight space must have made for some appalling conditions to work in. It soon became clear to Rowlands that he wasn't listening into the breaking of his local tobacconist and was actually monitoring an active bank robbery. Rowlands called Scotland Yard this time and played them back some of the audio over the phone. They were rightly alarmed by this and ordered that all banks, 750 in total within an 8 mile radius, be checked, which in the densely populated area of London at the time was an enormous task to complete, particularly with the trading hours. Now, Rowlands advised the police that he thought this fall hardy and that advised that the signals were much more local because the criminals were using battery powered walkie talkies. The police did manage to check all of the banks amazingly and they eventually arrived at Baker Street and proceeded down to the vault in the basement. The gang were alerted of their presence and fell quiet. The police officers were led down to the vault but seeing as all looked in place inside the bank and the door was firmly locked, the police were happy and moved on. Now in the movie it was detailed that the vault could not be opened because it was on a time release mechanism, however this was not the case. Once the gang got inside the vault they proceeded to pry open the safety deposit boxes and extract the contents. They managed to open up to 270 boxes. The boxes were filled with precious jewellery and cash, bonds and fairly mundane personal documents. It was detailed at the time that it may well have amounted to £4 million back in the day. During this time the police and Rowlands were monitoring the activity and were still none the wiser where the radio, radios were radios and raiders were located. The gang proceeded to pass their ill-gotten gains back down the muddy tunnel and into the basement of the store. The radioactivity continued sporadically with the rooftop lookout signalling any suspicious bystanders or vehicles. But alas, Rowlands and the police did not have sufficient evidence to pinpoint the actual location of the gang. The last activity that Rowlands heard on the radio was a gang member putting out a call to change channel. Eventually, however, this frantic scanning of the band, no signals could be heard. It is now thought that this final transmission was the code word for the gang to go silent and it make a way in their van with their valuable stash. The gang left the radios at the scene of the robbery and the police and the locals often cite this as the walkie-talkie robbery. 
As with the Hatton Garden heist, many people who had property in those boxes never came forward to claim any losses. It is thought some of the contents may be incriminating. The suggestion made in the movie is that Ganlang bosses used the safety deposit boxes to store their dealings with corrupt officials and police. There are also suggestions that inappropriate images of political figures engaged in sexual activity were also in the boxes. However, it is also claimed that the heist was partly an inside job by MI5 to exhume compromising photographs of the Queen of England's sister, Princess Margaret, engaging possibly sexually with a known London actor slash mobster called John Binden and that the government were being bribed into them being disclosed by their owner, a Trinidadian radical called Michael X, who held a deposit box in the vault. This speculation was heightened because people couldn't understand why the police would ignore the shortwave listener Roland, who told them specifically this must be taking place within just a few miles. The suspicion being that the gang would be rewarded with a free pass if they turned in the photos to MI5 and the gang would be able to get away with their ill-gotten gains. This is of course just pure conjecture and the gang were eventually captured and served up to 12 years inside for the robbery. Much of the contents of the boxes were never recovered and gang members have since not said anything about the heist other than when they got out they had realised that they had got way way more than they had bargained for. In a rather cool tw cruel twist to the story, the helpful shortwave listener Rollins, who had uncovered the heist and documented it very well on his tape player, found himself sat down being grilled by Scotland Yard on his unlicensed use of his receiver to listen into and rebroadcast the CB transmissions. Only in the UK could this happen, eh? However, all charges were dropped as it would have given to some rather bad publicity for the force and under the circumstances and in fact shortly after the case, Lloyds Bank sent Rowlands a cheque for £2,500, which is about £35,000 in today's money, as a thank you. I hope that you have found this story interesting. There is a lot more information out there on this story and of course you can watch the movie and other documentaries on the subject. It's a great case for and against our hobby, in a way. Roland sadly passed away, as has many of the investigating officers, and there are still classified documents that were sealed as not being able to be made public until 2071, a full 100 years after the crime had passed. Not sure I will be around long enough to find out, however, maybe someone might still be watching this video who will be. Anyway, who knows, and please keep scanning and listening in. You just don't know what you might tune into next. Until next time, 73. In the headlines this morning, a radio ham in London who picked up a conversation between two men using walkie-talkie sets started a hunt for bank robbers. Would you like to change to the other channel? Over. And after that, there were no more broadcasts, so one can only assume that was the code for leaving the bank. <laughs>